So today we're going to talk about education. And this is based on a book by uh, Murray Rothbard called Education Free and Compulsory. Uh, it's a bit difficult to translate into French because free has a double meaning, uh, freedom or free of charge, and you can't really do that in French. Um, but nonetheless, I try to uh, convey the essence of this uh, book rather than a blow-by-blow -blow account of every single paragraph. And I will try to not preach to the choir. I'll try to aim for a normie. So this person is a normal person. Okay? A normal person is a person who has not taken the uh, red pill. So this is the red pill and the blue pill here. Um, so if you take the blue pill, which the normie has taken, then you go on believing what you always believed. And if you take the red pill, which is this one here, then you uh, see how far deep the rabbit hole you can go. And uh, maybe you end up uh, in a boardroom uh, at this conference. <laughs> and just to make my life even harder, I will try to um, convey the essence of uh, Mary Rothbard's book to a um, French, oh, sorry, to a French normie. So it's very difficult to do that because public education is very much a sacred cow in France. You can't actually criticize uh, the very existence of public education in France without uh, being kicked out of the dinner party, basically. So, uh, so tough challenge. So to get started, uh, this man was the Prime Minister of France, and on June the 2nd, 1997, he made a uh, calculation mistake. Okay. The reason why he did that is because he's a socialist, and uh, we know socialists cannot calculate. Uh, so I'll go back to that in my third section. But what was the mistake? The mistake was that he appointed as Minister for Public Education this gentleman. So you can see right there the mistake. This man has bookshelves. They're filled with books. He's actually read these books. These are scientific books. He actually even wrote some of them. And more than that, he actually wrote some articles that were cited 500 times. Um, typical article. Uh, basalt, basalt weathering laws. Okay. So the guy is a real scientist, and you should never appoint a real scientist or a real university professor as Minister of Public Education, because he may have some ideas. You have to make him Minister of Transport if you want, but definitely not education. So obviously the mistake uh, was consummated. Uh, what was unavoidable happened 22 days, 22 days after the appointment. And um, Claude Allègre, the minister, pronounced this phrase, which has become absolutely famous in France, uh, which is, um, the mammoth has to slim down. The mammoth has to slim down. That's the only thing he said. Okay? And um, well, pretty obviously, from the context, you can tell what the mammoth is. The mammoth is the uh, national education in France. Indeed, when I was a... Uh, hostage of the French national education when I was uh, sorry, young, um, there was a saying that public edu education in France was the third largest employer in the whole world after the Red Army and General Motors. Okay. <laughs> Not sure if it was true, but uh, that was uh, what people th thought. And um, so the French public education has a lot of resources, visibly, uh, but does it employ them well? To do that, we can take the purest product of French public education. And his name is Laurent Laforgue. So that's him. He is uh, just receiving the Fields Medal, which is the highest uh, decoration in the field of mathematics. As you know, there is no Nobel Prize in mathematics, supposedly because Alfred Nobel's wife slept with a mathematician. <laughs> Not verified. Well, it wasn't me, certainly. Um, and, um, but, so the Fields Medal is as close as you're going to get. And it's actually pretty good. It's more like the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry, physics, or medicine. And it's not at all like those crazy Nobel Prizes in literature, or peace, or God forbid, economics. <laughs> so it's pretty serious stuff. So um, obviously, when you have uh, such uh, intellectual royalty in France, you want to appoint him to the High Commission for Education. 
the High Commission for Education. And um, yeah, this is, this is what he did. He did a paper on the Drinfeld Stukas. Uh, you can't make that up, okay? It's pure mathematics. So Drinfeld Stukas. When he was um, young, when he was at school, when he was a teenager, this guy would actually lock himself up in his parents' bathroom because it was the only room in the house, in the apartment, that had no light. And then he would obviously turn off all the lights and then he would roll a uh, towel underneath the little crack of the door to make sure that the light doesn't even go through the crack in the door. And there in the dark, he'd do algebraic topology in his head for hours. Okay. So that's sort of what it takes to, uh, to get the Fields Medal. And that's not in his official biography, but I actually know it. Um, so he got appointed to the uh, High Commission for um, uh, Education. And, um, and Lafargue is a serious guy. He actually uh, took his job seriously. He said, well, I'm going to approach this in a scientific method. So I'm going to read all the programs for French public education since 1881, when it was instituted by Jules Ferry, uh, all the way till the present. I'm going to decide which is the best program. So he did all this analysis, took a lot of time, a lot of work, and he concluded the best programs were from 1923. So that means from 1923, for, from 80 or 90 years onwards, it's all been going downhill. Every single reform has been, you know, horrible, okay? So that's his conclusion. And he was appointed to the High Commission uh, on uh, November 8. He gave his report on no November 16, and he was fired on November 17. <laughs> that was uh, pretty quick. Which uh, starts to beg the question, uh, is the uh, French state, or you know, any state for that matter, the right institution to educate children? Is it capable of introspection? Is it capable of uh, maybe finding its own limits in the field of education? Is it capable of reforming itself? And um, the bigger question is, rather than look for the next reform, you know, maybe we should just question the premise. Maybe the nation state was never the institution that should have been uh, taking care of education. Okay, so that's the question I want to ask. And there is no better guide to uh, ask this question than the book by Murray Rothbard, Education Free and Compulsory. So there will be three parts. Uh, one part on history of public education, how education became to be a public uh, affair. Uh, and economic, uh, there, there'll be some sort of more general philosophical considerations. I'll finish with an economic analysis of the provision of education services by the state. So, start with the history. Um, today, it's actually almost impossible to imagine a uh, system of education that would not be run by the nation state. So, we just sort of assume it has to be done like that. Uh, however, that cannot possibly be true because the nation state was instituted by the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, as we know it. This generally, that's sort of really the, the basis of everything. And clearly, there was education before 1648, uh, at least uh, since uh, the days of uh, Karl der Gross or Charlemagne. There was education and uh, lots of philosophers, you know, thinkers, mathematicians, scientists. So they must have been educated somehow. So clearly, uh, that predated the nation state. Um, you could have other institutions than the state producing education. It could be uh, the maybe local uh, institutions, the religious institutions. It could be uh, charitable institutions. The families, small groups of families could get together uh, by affinity. Um, there are many ways to think about that. You could have professional leagues of carpenters teaching carpentry, for example. You could have, uh, outside a big university, there could be uh, a microcosm of uh, preparations for the entrance exams. Um, yeah, many things you could do. And nowadays, nowadays uh, you could have a homeschooling and the Khan Academy. So the Khan Academy, the Khan Academy is on the internet. So basically, you can learn everything you want from there. And it's sort of very, very good. So the possibilities are limitless. And indeed, before the state took over education, the variations were infinite. Um, So if there's one thing that I want you to remember today from this talk, is that all the features of public education that you're familiar with, 
Um, they're actually not very natural at all. They come from the Prussians. So if you think that the public schooling in France is a bit authoritarian, there's a reason for that, because it was invented by the Prussians and copied later on. So um, what happened is that, obviously, now the message is changing. You don't teach God and, and, um, and the king you know, as a, uh, the message. Now the message is more about the environment and, uh, and human rights, you know, but the technique for teaching it is still exactly you know, Prussian. In um, October 14, 1806, the French Emperor Napoleon I inflicted a uh, vicious defeat upon the King of Prussia at the Battle of Jena. And the generals of the king, rather than admit that they had fallen to a superior strategist, put the blame on the little guy, on the soldiers. The soldiers were not sufficiently willing to sacrifice themselves for the king. So that was the theory. And then um, the solution then was to start a program of youth education to instill Germanic values uh, into the German children before they go into battle. There's a Chinese saying, which is that you have to twist the cucumber when it's young. So that's what they did. And um, so I'm citing here from Rothbard, some of the appalling things that they did were they abolished uh, semi-religious private schools. Um, all education was placed under the authority of the Ministry for Interior. There was a state exam that was made compulsory. Um, all teachers had to be vetted by the state. And uh, there was a sophisticated bureaucracy was put in place to manage schooling in all the cities and in the countryside. Okay? And then in order to get into the civil service or into university or into the professions, you had to take some state administered exams. So all these things, which so we take for granted now, that's really the way education is organized, they were actually completely unnatural, unnatural and they were invented uh, by the Prussians. Okay? So, um, once they had taken control of education through these authoritarian means, they um, organized the school exactly like the army, by age cohorts. So that's a bit unnatural also to put me with, you know, if I'm 16 with other 16-year-olds, maybe I'd be better off with 17-year-olds or with a variety of people. But uh, in the army, you're all, all the same age. And um, there was obviously a, a lot of uh, propaganda about national pride. And there was also a real effort to prevent children from learning the languages of the enemies. So that, uh, for example, in France, we say, oh, no, 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 you cannot learn any language until you're at least 12 or 13 or 14 because it's too complicated, you know. And now we know, obviously, from linguistics research that it's a lot easier to learn a language when you're two than when you're, you're 12. Um, and certainly, if you look at the aristocracy uh, before the French Revolution, they all spoke many languages and maybe they had uh, private tutors who would teach them in languages from the earliest age. So that was the technique that was used by the Prussian model. And um, well, did it work? The answer is, unfortunately, yes. It worked really well. So this is the uh, revenge. So Jena was 1806. This is the revenge. It's 1871, um, the uh, uh, Franco-Prussian War. And uh, to the left, we have the defeated Napoleon III at uh, Sedan, where he was caught. And uh, to the right, we have Bismarck having a little friendly chat with him. So it worked really well. And uh, the um, uh, soldiers from the Prussian army were very willing to uh, get shot in order to uh, save the homeland. Um, indeed, Léon Gambetta, who was a Parisian politician who was famous for getting away from Paris in a hot air balloon while it was encircled by the Prussians. Uh, he said, it is not the Prussian general who won the war, it is the Prussian schoolmaster. And it will be up to the French schoolmaster to win the next war. Okay. That was in 1871. So um, it's very prophetic. <clears throat> so after the defeat, what did France do? 
France, the cradle of human rights, democracy, the republic. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to do it Prussian style. So they just copied everything from the Prussian schoolmaster, and uh, they, uh, they, they started the uh, French public education in 1881. The big offender there was Jules Ferry. I don't like his beard. So he's really a bad person. Um, even at the time, in 1888, uh, there was a Parisian counselor named Louis Fiot who wrote a book saying, uh, Jules Ferry, a malfaiteur public, so a public malefactor or public criminal, so first class criminal. So what was his crime? Basically, uh, the crime of Jules Ferry was that he pretended, he liberated the minds of the little children by educating them. But he wasn't really doing any of that. He just replaced uh, propaganda for monarchy and for Christianity or Catholicism, which was really very deeply embedded in the school system prior to him, with propaganda for the republic and for atheism. Okay. So he just replaced one type of propaganda by the other. That's really what the whole book here is saying. And um, so it's not exactly liberating. Okay. Um, the worst offender from this era was this little book here, Le Tour de la France par deux enfants, uh, means uh, going around France by two children. And it's uh, the story of two little, uh, little boy and his, his sister who are from that part of France that uh, is basically Germanic speaking, and they eat, you know, sort of like Germans eat, uh, that was taken over by the Prussians in 1870, 1871, so it's Alsace and Lorraine. So you have two children from there, and obviously they get kicked out by the Prussians, and uh, they go all around France, in all the regions of France, to see their relatives. And every time they say, oh, we'd really like to go back. And then at the end of the book, they, uh, they look over the border, and they, they see the little village over there, but they can't go back because it's Prussia now, or it's Germany now. So uh, this is the book where most children learn how to read. So the first thing you read is you have to get these pieces of land from the Germans back. That's the first thing you read. Um, millions of copies were printed. Uh, I think eight million in total. And uh, we have some modern French uh, philosophers uh, Jacques Mona Ozouf, who said this was the little red book of the French Third Republic. Okay. And my grandmother learned to read in this one, okay. but she, didn't, she wasn't aware there was a bit of propaganda in it. So, uh, did it work? Did it work? Well, yes, it worked quite well. Certainly, uh, we had World War I, so in 1914, everybody really went out fighting. Like in French, we say la fleur au fusil, means uh, they put flowers in, um, sort of in, their, in their guns because they were so happy to go fighting. Okay. So that really worked, it was very effective. And so uh, here we have the first lesson about uh, free public education, because uh, Jules Ferry uh, sent these teachers into all the little villages in France, and they were free. Oh, come, give us your sons. We're going to teach them how to read and write and count for free. It's great, it's free, uh, paid for by the taxpayers. But it wasn't really as free as advertised, because after 1914, in every village, there was a monument to the dead of World War I, like this one. So it wasn't exactly free, it was paid for by the blood of your sons and grandsons. Nobody told them that initially. And so um, um, that goes under the there's no such, such thing as a free lunch kind of thing, or, or another saying would be that uh, sometimes it is those things in life that are free that are the most expensive. Okay, so that's the history part. Um, now we're going to go to more sort of philosophical considerations about can we trust the state to educate our children? And uh, clearly, if you look at the original history of the Franco-Prussian War and World War I, that sort of starts as a no, but maybe things are better now. It's the current year, it's 2016, maybe we can trust the state. So let's think about that. 
And the first remark that I would like to make on this point is that prior to the takeover of the education by the state, there was uh, what is known as a division between the spiritual power and tem temporal power. So temporal power is the power you know, in, this, in this earth, and spiritual is more in the next life or more of the power of the mind. The spiritual power was in the hands of the church, and the temporal power was in the hands of the state. So there was a bit of counterbalance which worked in favor of uh, the little people. Uh, but uh, just logically, once you start to educate the children, then you put ideas in their minds, and the mind is spiritual. So now we have a fusion of the spiritual power to educate and of the temporal power to basically uh, is the person who has the guns. Okay? So as a result, the state says, not only will I tell you what to think, but if you disagree with me, I can throw you in jail because I got the guns and you don't. Okay? And uh, you're going to think, well, it cannot happen here. We are in democracy. This is the current year. No, it's not possible. Let's just give you one example from Germany. Hans Professor Hopper is German. So in Germany, uh, this, uh, so the statistics are that from 2001 to 2010, according to the Office for the Protection of the Constitution, it's a bit of evil sounding kind of name, but it exists, uh, there were 140,000 criminal investigations for thought crimes. So thought crime is not just something in George Orwell's book, it's actually in the books of the reports of the Office for the Protection of Constitution, and this is sort of the number per year, okay? 140,000, I'm not saying all of them were thrown into jail, but they had to answer some pretty tough questions, and some of them were thrown into jail. And this uh, particular data, I probably shouldn't say that, but I will not name names, was collected from the official report of the uh, Office for the Protection of the Constitution by a, a German thought criminal who spent two and a half years in jail for writing a chemistry thesis on the properties of prosec acid. So, you know, you have to be very careful what you study when you're a chemist. Um, so that was my first remark. The second remark would be that <coughs> um, the uh, kind of education that the state wants to produce has one tendency, uh, it's tendency towards uniformization and equalization. Okay. It's always going to be like that. Certainly if you open your eyes in France, you see equality is really the, uh, the objective here. And um, I can do no better to comment on that than to cite directly from the book by Murray Rothbard. Um, he says that since abilities and interests are naturally diverse, a drive towards making people equal in all or most respects is necessarily a leveling downwards. It is a drive against the development of talent, against the development of genius, variety, and reasoning power. And since it negates the very principles of human life and human growth, the creed of equality and uniformity is a creed of death and destruction. Death and destruction. So, Murray Rothbard does not mince words, but I fully agree with him. Okay, and my third remark uh, in this chapter will be that um, trusting that the state has very noble intentions when it comes to educating your children, that's a little bit naive, okay? And you do not even need to be a hardcore Austro-Libertarian to believe that. Um, you can take Noam Chomsky, who is a linguist from MIT and very left-wing. He's very left-wing, okay? And he said, uh, after he gave a conference on the world after 9-11. He said, it is only in folk tales, children's stories, and the journals of intellectual opinion, so I think he means, you know, New York Times or something like that, uh, that power is used wisely and well to destroy evil. The real world teaches very different lessons, and it takes willful and dedicated ignorance to fail to perceive them. So I really like this quote because he speaks about willful and dedicated ignorance. So to remain naive, you have to make a real effort to remain naive. And this, again, from George Orwell, 1984, has a name. It's called Stop Crime. 
So stop crime is the ability that when you get to the frontier of thought crime, you, know, you have a spider sense, you're getting close to there, and you shut down all your reasoning abilities. You shut down your ability to understand analogies, to uh, detect fallacies, and so you stop yourself from thinking before you commit a thought crime. Okay. So I think that that's really um, describes a lot of normies uh, out there. And, um, and uh, I will, my last citation in this section will have to be from uh, Professor Block because we have honored with his presence here. Uh, he wrote an article with Andrew Young uh, and uh, he says that the individuals entrenched in position of power in the state are those with control over what the children learn in history, in government theory, economics, and so forth. So the result is that you have citizens who are educated by the operators of the state into how to choose the operators of the state. So I think it's very clear that we have a, bit of a logical loop here. And um, to conclude this section, I will say that I have come to the conclusion and I hope uh, you follow me on that one, that asking the state to educate our children is exactly like asking the Khmer Rouge uh, to be in charge of the High Commission for the Promotion of Human Rights. Okay. And uh, I'm glad you find this funny because it's actually not mine. It's not my quote. It's from Laurent Laforgue, who's the guy who um, got fired after 10 days. <laughs> so, I go to oh, yeah, the Khmer Rouge taking over Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Not friendly. So, uh, so now I have probably a few minutes to uh, finish, and uh, the last section will be, is the state even capable of educating? So even assuming that it would want to do a good job, is it technically feasible? And the answer comes from uh, the mentor of Murray Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises, uh, in his article entitled Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, published in 1920, uh, he showed that um, if the state wants to produce a good, so it's, a, it's not, his paper is not about education, but it does apply in this case. The problem with public education is that it's free so that the parents, the consumers, the families, the end users do not uh, vote with their wallets, so they do not produce signals which would be, well, this teacher I'm willing to hire at that price to teach that particular subject uh, in that school. So the only way that you can see if the teacher and the subject satisfy the families, if the families actually pay some money for it. So in the absence of such signal, um, it is impossible to organize the production of uh, education. Okay? So, um, the public education is about 13% of government spending in France, but how is that money spent? How is that planification going? Well, you can't really answer that because the signals, which is the satisfaction of the parents paying for education, is not produced. Okay? Um, the school buildings are scarce. The school books are scarce. There's not an infinite number of school books. There's not an infinite number of teachers either. So how are you going to uh, organize them into a production plan, knowing that the number of production plans is infinite. The only way to do that would be if, at the end, uh, the parents were to signal what production meets their objectives, and because they don't, then you have uh, chaos, or as Mises would say, you have planned chaos. The analogy here would be that um, the French state is no more capable of producing education than the Soviet Union was capable of filling up the supermarkets with groceries. So when uh, uh, Khrushchev on the left visited the US uh, in the 60s, that's him with John F. Kennedy, he said, oh yeah, I just want to see a supermarket. So he went out with his entourage and they showed, well, there's a supermarket right there around the corner. He like, looked up and down, and it was full, full of tomatoes and salt and eggs and everything. So, said, ah, no, you guys are tricking me. It's a Potemkin village. I want a real supermarket. I want to <laughs> so he went to like a few of them. After the third or fourth, he could realize that they couldn't actually stock up the shelves fast enough for him, so it must be real. 
And uh, when he compared that with uh, the typical supermarket, in, this, is, this is a historical picture from the Soviet Union. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> That's what comes out when you have Soviet supermarkets um, on, on, on Google images. The <clears throat> Groceries are written in English, so clearly <laughs> it's a bit of an error here. But you, know, you get the point. Um, and the basic idea was that in the same way, the Soviet Union could not organize the production plans and allocation of scarce resources of production because it was not a capitalist economy and people in the end wouldn't pay the fair price. So communism you know, doesn't work at producing things. Okay. So you could say that if this argument were correct, then it would also imply that the state is not capable of producing public health, public health care. You could say that. And you could even go further. You could say that the same argument implies that the state is not capable of producing security. And we have the book from Professor Hopper just out there on the myth of national defense, for example. So yes, you could say that, and you would be right. But given that this is aimed at the normie, and uh, we're, go we're only going to take one red pill at a time, so we're just going to focus on education today. OK, so now is, I think my time is almost over. So I will conclude, and I hope I have convinced you that uh, the circumstances under which the state took control of education in the 19th century were extremely dodgy. Um, and they had no qualms about it. They actually admitted it black and white back then. Now, if you say that, it's a bit politically incorrect, but they were pretty happy with explaining their reasons. Um, also, I hope I've convinced you that the state does not want to do a good job of educating your children because it is not in its own interest to have uh, citizens who are able to think by themselves. And uh, finally, I hope I've convinced you that even if the state wanted to do a good job, it still couldn't because uh, in the absence of the price signal generated every time a parent pays for education of his or her child in a certain way, in the absence of the signal, you can't actually organize production in an economically um, correct way. Okay? So my conclusion will be that just as we have a separation of church and state, uh, we also need separation of school and state. Thank you.